A group of former high-ranking national security officials is demanding that Congress address efforts to destabilize U.S. elections. In a letter, the group wrote that, we believe these efforts are profoundly damaging to our national security. They also called on lawmakers to take action to safeguard elections ahead of the 2022 midterms and beyond. So for more on this, I want to bring in Olivia Troy. She was a Homeland Security and Counterterrorist Advisor for former Vice President Mike Pence. And Olivia, what we are talking about are, you know, the threats are coming from inside. They're inside the House. Um, in the years since the last election, we've seen unprecedented uh, efforts to undermine really the confidence in the U.S. election system. Um, we have seen hyper-partisan reviews of 2020 election results, like what we saw in Arizona. How damaging are these reviews when it comes to voter confidence in the election process? Thanks for having me. You know, they're gravely da damaging. That is why, you know, we are a group of nearly 100 former national security officials, former ambassadors, former military officers, leaders, intelligence officers, who remain concerned about what's happening here, especially domestically. And it's damaging because it's undermining voter confidence in our electoral processes, it's undermining our democracy. And on the world stage, it's actually undermining the United States globally. Other countries, foreign adversaries are watching what is happening here and you know, we used to be the beacon of democracy, the world, the, you know, the, the leading power, the, the freedom country, the country of freedom. And, you know, these foreign adversaries exploit situations like this when they see us struggling, when they see the images of January 6th, when they see what's happening here domestically, and they use this as opportunities. And look, what's happening here domestically is also gravely dangerous in terms of our homeland security and the types of potential for political violence that we've seen, the escalation, and these great divisions that we're seeing of, you know, the undermining of voter confidence where we have a whole population out there that actually believes that the 2020 election was rigged and stolen. You, you know, Olivia, it, it's, it's so fascinating to me because it's one thing to see something on social media or a hyperpartisan website or news organization it's quite another when a member of an administration or a sitting member of Congress gets on TV and either lies or spreads misinformation. Uh, and you recently, you retweeted something or you tweeted something that I thought was fascinating. Uh, the former advisor to uh, former President Trump, Kellyanne Conway, was appearing on another network and she made the point that during the Trump administration, she says that, quote, we never heard of such a thing. There was no supply chain crisis. And I remember thinking to myself, that is news to a lot of people in this country who couldn't get toilet paper, who couldn't buy um, thermometers, who couldn't get Lysol or Clorox wipes. And you tweeted this. My recollection is quite different than Kellyanne Conway's, especially when it comes to the 2020 crisis. I seem to recall being in the same room with her at a lot of White House discussions with the former guy, presumably President Trump, former President Trump, about supply chain shortages ranging from PPE all the way to TP. So my question is, if you are only watching one particular network or only reading one particular blog or website, they're not going to know what you know, which is that she's basically spreading misinformation. She's lying because you were there with her when you discuss a supply and shade crisis in the Oval Office. Yes, and that's what, it, what makes this so challenging and incredibly dangerous. It's you've got echo chambers happening on these networks where they give these people a platform to push these lies and misinformation and disinformation. And so, and, and the people who are watching believe it, right? And these are the supporters of these groups. And that is how you enable these groups to succeed, these extremists and these people who use lies to push information. And when you, you, know, when you grill them on or you ask them questions and you're seeing what's happening right now, with uh, what's happening with the subpoenas on January 6th. And you have Stephen Miller going on the network saying, oh, I haven't gotten the papers and this is just a distraction on what's happening in the Biden administration. We're not actually speaking with facts. It's just spin and it's grift and it's ongoing, but it's so dangerous because it's working and they know that it's working and that they lie. And if you repeat the lie, people believe it. And look, in the case of Kellyanne Conway, I was irate when I saw that because I remember people sewing masks. I remember 
people, you know, wearing garbage bags, frontline workers, healthcare workers yeah. wearing garbage bags as PPE at times when they ran out of the hospitals. I remember sitting in the room with the doctors on that task force saying, what are we going to do? We're at a mask. Hospitals are struggling. Uh, you know, households can't get masks. And I was just so frustrated when I saw that. I mean, I remember not being able to get Lysol wipes, um, toilet paper, especially, uh, you know, Outside of that, think about, you know, computer chips were hard to get. People couldn't buy cars. It's hard to get a couch these days. I mean, I recently moved. I couldn't get a couch. Mm -hmm. It takes months. Um, this is all legacy. This was going on during the Trump administration. And so to sit there and flat out lie to people because it's a convenient narrative of something that you want to push that is, you know, pushing an alternate reality is fundamentally dangerous. It's dangerous, you know, supply chain. It's dangerous in terms of our elections, it's dangerous in terms of what you're telling people. Uh, that That is what leads to events like January 6th. It leads to people attempted bombings on the Capitol. And we saw somebody drive you know, thousands of miles and claiming that it was his patriotic, and I say that in quotes, duty, and he's taking a stand for everyone because this is what they're watching. And they're, they're being told this by people like Kellyanne Conway, and they're being told this by elected leaders. And people like Kevin McCarthy don't care. They don't call out these lies. They don't call out the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world. They don't call out the Gosars of the world that are basically pushing violence on other elected leaders. And that is why we're so gravely concerned about what we're seeing here, the patterns of behavior and what's happening here in our country. We've seen this happen overseas. We've seen this in other countries. And it is so hard to see it happening here domestically. I mean, the enemy is within. It's within our country, unfortunately, right now. So, you know, to what both you and Vlad said, that in, when it comes to misinformation, some of the people that are guilty of spreading it are elected officials. They're in Congress. Um, yet you're asking Congress to do something about it. What do you think Congress can and will do? That's a great question. I, you know, this is the time to do everything you can. And I... And I do believe, especially, uh, you know, we've got to support the Democrats right now in terms of what's happening here. Um, we've got to support those principled lawmakers, a small group of Republicans that are taking a stand on this. Uh, you know, whether it's you know requiring uh, the use of paper ballots, um, I really think that we should be doing everything we can to secure our election equipment. Um, you know, we can't have unvetted people accessing election equipment and allowing it to be potentially exploited. I mean, we saw what happened in Arizona in terms of that sham audit that was ongoing and people were taking the equipment out, but unauthorized people using that. I mean, things like that are really critical, I think. And also there's a, there's a responsibility here for leaders to call people out on this. To, we all have a responsibility of speaking out and, start, and, and telling the truth. You know, it can't be, you know, it's Liz Cheney right now. <laughs> She's telling the truth and a few others on the Republican side. And you know, shame on people like Elise Stefanik and shame on people like Kevin McCarthy who are allowing this to happen in exchange for power, because that's really what it is. It's an exchange for maintaining and, and power, point, gaining power. Sorry, Vlad, before you jump in, I just I would want to point out that there are also, you know, you pointed out some Republicans who are, are speaking out. There are many, many Republicans who ran the elections uh, in Pennsylvania, in Arizona, who were who have also spoken out, who have also said that the elections were fair and have been very critical of, of the pushback that um, that we are getting from some people um, on Capitol Hill. So I just want to kind of point that out as well. Sorry, go ahead, Vlad. Yeah, yeah. Well, Olivia, you're a lifelong Republican. I mean, you, you know, you served under various Republican administrations, um, and yet you uh, publicly uh, endorsed uh, President Biden in the last election. Um, and I wonder, to your point about the some Republicans who continue to push the big lie, who continue when President Trump releases these statements that go further than anything we even heard prior to the election. And it doesn't, President Trump isn't going to change. I mean, he's not going to change the tactics that he's been using throughout essentially the entire course of his presidency. So if 
you continue to see this big lie being the refrain of it over and over and over again by fellow Republicans or people who are still in the Republican Party. At some point, it, the car, you know, the horse is going to leave the barn or the, the cow is going to leave the barn and it'll be too late because Emory points out that there were some uh, many Republican uh, governors and secretaries of state who did their sworn duty. But that may not be the case in 2024. So how prepared are we for that? No, and it is very concerning. Um, I, I don't believe we're prepared. And, uh, you know, it, and I'm glad that she mentioned the fact that there have been a lot of state and local officials who have taken a stand. And I should mention that that is actually one aspect that we should really be focusing on is how are we going to protect the local officials? How are we going to protect the election officials and the polling places when they mm -hmm. get the threats? Because when these people, people take a stand for truth, they get threats. Their families get threatened. Their lives get threatened. I mean, look, even even the Republicans that voted for the bill that just passed this week, you know, Congressman Upton, he's getting hateful, threatening voicemails for just simply standing up for his constituents and voting for something that'll benefit his community and the people that voted for him. And so at all levels here, now it's become this, if you step out of line and you step outside what the echo chamber is telling you, you get threats. And... Um, and I think it's super dangerous. I think we're mainstreaming this time of extremism in the Republican Party. And I am concerned about what this means going forward in future elections and in 2024. You're correct. Trump, you know, he sticks to the playbook. And you know, one thing you got to give him credit for is what you see is what you get. He doesn't hide who he is. And a lot of the people in his inner circle don't hide who they are either. It's out in front. It's, it, it's, it's shameful, but it's obvious. And so I think... You know, I don't know that we're prepared to kind of stop what is happening here. I think it's going to be incumbent, you know, at all levels to really pay attention at all state levels, whether it's, you know, secretaries of state, attorney general positions. I'm talking all levels here, paying attention to what's going on in your communities and, and getting out to vote and getting that information out and really voting for responsible leaders, principal leaders, people who care about actual policy and governance rather than you know, grievance, politics, lies, and conspiracies, which is what we're seeing right now, unfortunately, in the Republican Party. Olivia, the uh, congressional investigation into the attack on the Capitol is looking at a number of things, including, you know, what the vice president was doing at the time, the former vice president, Mike Pence, how he spent those hours, the conversations that he had with the president. You are a former advisor to him. Did he ever talk to you about the election, the election results, the attack on the Capitol on January 6th, whether or not he was asked not to certify the results? Did, did you ever co have a conversation about that? No, I have not spoken to the former vice president about that. Um, what I will say is mm. I hope that uh, members of the staff will cooperate with the investigation of the January 6th committee. Um, I'm hopeful that they will to tell the truth. I mean, they lived it. They lived it firsthand. Um, there's documentation of it. And I think it's important for the sake of history. It's important for Americans to really understand the truth from someone who was there and lived it, someone who had his own you know, president, commander in chief above him, basically send a uh, an entire group of people in to attack him for just doing his job and doing the right thing, which was upholding his constitutional duty to certify an election. Yeah, and, and we all saw those images and we heard uh, those voices of those individuals who were storming the Capitol, what they said and what they did and the implements that they brought into the Capitol building, uh, looking for members of Congress, looking for Vice President Pence. Uh, and you know Vice President Pence, uh, Olivia. Um, you know, we, we don't know if he's going to run for president. We've started to hear some politicians, uh, notably Chris Christie, is is sort of, you know, inching to the line of slightly criticizing President Trump, mainly around the fact that President Trump didn't win the election. And Chris Christie's refrain is that, you know, you got to win. That's the most important thing. But but do you expect um, if the vice president, the former vice president stays in the public eye, that much in the same way that he did his constitutional duty uh, in the wake of the uh, 2020 election, that he will talk to the American people honestly, transparently, about what happened and what he witnessed in, in the White House, even if it means that he will anger the diehard, vehement supporters of the former president? 
I know I'm asking you to sort of think into his head, but you, given that you're you're the one, we, we you know, we only know, we know you, we don't know him. So that's why we're asking. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get that. And uh, listen, I, I, I want to believe and hope that he would. Uh, I, I would I would love for him to really tell the truth about what it was like to be in the Trump administration for four years serving as the vice president. And I certainly know of uh, a few moments, especially when it came to the COVID pandemic, a frustration of what it's like to be working long hours with a group of doctors trying to figure out what to do when you're constantly being undermined every single day in one of the biggest crises that we've faced in our country. And we're seeing a lot of that legacy and divisiveness on this topic play out still today. And that is a legacy of Donald Trump. And there is no denying that. Like I was there in the room, many of us lived it firsthand and we saw what was happening. And so I, I, yeah, I, I want Pence to come forward and, and speak truthfully and start to walk away from Trumpism. That is the best thing actually that I think that he could do for the country. But unfortunately, politics is politics and palace intrigue and power, it's real. And I think he does have his sights on 2024. And, you know, he is angered that Trump base. I don't see them coming back to him. They see him as a traitor. So in my opinion, he's got nothing to lose other than actually taking a stand and speaking truthfully and doing the right thing right now for America. But I don't see those people coming back to him. But I think that the calculus here politically is can he gain some of the trust back because he, I, I, you know, it's known uh, right now that I think you need that Trump voting base in order to win in elections. We're seeing that happen. We just saw that in recent elections where that base came out to vote. And if you're a Republican, I think you're carefully balancing that line of how do you balance this, even if you don't want to believe in Trumpism? But right now, that's where the party is. And the party's leadership is all in on what that is, unfortunately. And so I think the extreme factions are now in control. Uh, whether whether the leadership wants to admit that or not, it's very obvious. And so I think for Pence, I think it's a long road ahead. Um, and I don't know. I think he will struggle with that going forward. And I think it'll make it very challenging for him. And I don't know if he is willing um, or has the courage to come forward and separate himself from this. Yeah, it is an intriguing proposition because on the one hand, you, as you say, there is a rabid uh, base that is extremely supportive of the former president. On the other, uh, you could conceivably see a world where, let's remember that sometimes elections you vote for, you vote against the person as much as you vote for uh, a candidate. Um, and if you, if the analysis shows that many people, Republicans or independents, suburbanites, voted for President Biden because they just didn't like President Trump, even though they agreed, for example, with his policies on, on appointing judges, and they may have even agreed on some of his policies when it came to immigration uh, or defense spending or taxes, but they just didn't like him. And so perhaps there are enough of those Republicans that uh, former Vice President Pence or somebody else, a Chris Christie, uh, a Mike Pompeo, sees as a way to counterbalance um, that that base, that that sort of uh, vehement supportive base of, of President Trump. The question is, do you have the courage, as you say, Olivia, to take that on and deal with the repercussions, which, as we know from you know Congressman Upton, are are very real. Yes, and we've seen, you know, we've seen what's happening with uh, some of the Republicans who took a stand after January 6th. Um, some of them have decided not to run for re-election, uh, like Representative Gonzalez. And we're seeing what's happening within the party with Liz Cheney. Uh, you know, she has been out there. Um, she is. She knows the critical importance of the January 6th investigation, you know, not only for accountability, which still has yet to be happened in terms of the people, the main enablers that, that led to that dark day, but accountability at all levels and also um, helping our intelligence apparatus, our homeland security apparatus, really understand how that came to be, what happened so that we can sort of overcome those failures of whatever happened in terms of the inaction of the, the threats and the intelligence that was there so that this doesn't happen again. And that's why it's so critical. Look, my greatest fear to be very candid is I am very concerned about Trump running again in 2024. 
And I do believe that if he runs, he will have the nomination likely. That's just the truth um, on where the Republican Party is. And I think, you know, that will be an even darker day, I believe, for our democracy, because then we're looking at someone who, you know, we, we know does not let go of power easily. And um, I think the Republican Party will struggle uh, in terms of those who do not want to see this happen um, when, if he does run. And, I, you know, I think it's over for everyone else if he does. And that is where I think those moderates, people, you know, when you're center right um, and the center left, I mean, that is where it's going to be incumbent on that population to really take a step back and really understand from a more holistic viewpoint what's really happening here for our country. And we've got to all kind of come together and work together to stand against us. Olivia Troy, uh, thank you very much for coming on with us at CBS News. Come back and see us. We'd love to continue the conversation. We appreciate it. Thank you.